Alrighty, so welcome to the final video doing an analysis of Army leadership field manuals. Just like I said, this one is going to sound like I'm being kind of snarky and maybe things are going to seem a little out of context, and that's because these have all been iterative. So in order to see the entire analysis, you have to go back to the beginning, the one from 1948, and watch all of them because then you'll have context about what's changed and what's dropped out and what's been brought in and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this has been very interesting and also, I believe, kind of re revelatory, at least to me. Uh, and hopefully it's useful to somebody out there. So um, that's it. So we're just going to get right into it now. What happens is at this point in the history, the Army came out with Field Manual 6-22, uh, from October 2006 and then all they did was publish updates to it and the updates are interesting as well <laughs> so um, what I'm gonna do is I've like I said this is now a good PDF so there'll be a lot of flipping around but not as bad as with the other ones so we're just gonna get right into it because I don't want this to be too long alright so um, statement in the forward this is from Peter Schumacher uh, I just love this, right? It says, this manual uses be no do concept to express what is required of army leaders. It is critical that the army leaders be agile, multi-skilled pentathletes who have strong moral character, broad knowledge, and keen intellect. Cool, right? The problem is, I was in during this time, and we didn't have these sort of people. There was a lot of people that weren't like this at all. So how do we find them, right? These are these are true statements, but uh, but but you're always I'm always left with good statement. I have not seen that in existence, or I have, but it's been rare. All right. So next is definition of leadership. Now I, I love this. Right. Army leader: anyone who, by virtue of assumed role or assigned responsibility, inspires and influences people to accomplish organizational goals. Army leaders motivate both inside and outside the chain of command to pursue actions, focus thinking, and shape decisions for the greater good of the organizations. Values and it attributes are the same for all leaders regardless of position, although refined through experience and assumption of positions of greater responsibility. Now, what I find interesting about that is the assumption is that that means that only if you are in a role or have some sort of responsibility, you're a leader. That goes against everything that we've seen doing this analysis, right? Not just the analysis on the manuals, but with other stuff. People that have natural leadership ability exist. Just because you're in a leadership position does not make you a leader. We've said that. But it's once again, it's these blithe assumption. And then this statement, I have no idea what this means. Knowledge shapes a leader's identity and is reinforced by a leader's actions. I, I've thought about this a lot. I don't know what that means. Knowledge shapes a leader's identity. So what you know becomes who you are and then is reinforced. So that seems to me more like belief. Belief is reinforced by your actions, right? I can know something and, and then not act on it. So is it reinforced negatively? I don't know. I, some of these statements just don't don't make any sense. Um, oh, look, I even wrote that same comment. Not this sure what that means. All right, so here's the definition, chapter 1, 1.2. Go down to uh, 1.7. So this is the next page in the document. Leadership is the process of influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation while operating to accomplish the mission and improving the organization. Okay, cool, but now we're to the point where anybody can be a leader, right? Not anybody, but people outside of leadership positions can be leaders, true. Um, what I do like about this too is I, I didn't know this was the definition that came up with, but purpose, direction, motivation, 
fine, accomplish the mission so we got goals and improving the organization. Okay, is that, is that, I mean, is that inherent? So leaders are supposed to improve the organization? I don't know, because I've, I've seen leaders that take over and make things much worse. So, so is this implicit? I, this is the first time this has come up, improving the organization. So then here's what starts to bother me. Um, let's see, what did I put down here? All right, so here we talk about purpose, direction, and motivation. And then they give an example of a motor sergeant. Now that's a, basically a guy that's in charge of the vehicles in the, in the organization. So battalion motor sergeant always takes the time and patience to explain the mechanics what's required of them. Sergeant does this by calling together a few minutes to talk about the workload and time constraints. Although many soldiers tire of hearing from the sergeant talk about how well they're doing if they're essential mission accomplishment, blah, blah, blah. They know it is true and appreciate the comments. Every time the motor sergeant passes information during the meeting, they send a clear signal. People are cared for and valued. So by passing information, you're showing that people are cared for and valued. I don't, that doesn't make any sense. You're passing information because people need to know why they're doing something. So then they have purpose and direction, which is in the definition. But now we're saying this is care and value because you're telling them something. The payoff ultimately comes when the unit is alerted for combat deployment. As events unfold at breakneck speed, the motor sergeant will not have time to explain, acknowledge performance, or motivate them. Soldiers will do their jobs because the leader has earned their trust. So by having a meeting and telling them stuff, you've earned their trust. No. You have to have integrity. You got to have humility. You got to have empathy. You got to pay attention to stuff. You got to make sure everything's running right. You got to never lie to them. That's how you earn their trust. And showing that they're cared for and valued, that's empathy. That's vigilance. That's personal involvement. That's not a meeting. Ridiculous example. Um, all right, so then the next one here. Uh, right? Motivation, motivation, blah, blah, blah. Motivation spurs initiative when something needs to be accomplished. Okay. Um, so maybe the first time, right? So something's falling apart, something looks bad. Hey, I'm going to fix it. Is that motivation or initiative? Initiative means I'm going to fix it. But then what happens? If you have a boss that doesn't like the way it was done, doesn't like being made to look bad, doesn't look like it wasn't their idea, or decides to be overtly critical about the way it was done, they're never gonna do that again. So they might be motivated once, but how do you keep going with the motivation? That's when you show that they're cared for. That's when you say good job. That's when you, you know, you, many of you may have heard the phrase, good initiative, bad judgment. Say, so, hey, you tried, didn't work. But I'm glad you tried. Good job. You know, you didn't break the law. Nobody got killed. Good initiative. Could have done a little different. Let's talk about how to do it different. That's how you keep motivation going. Then people want to do stuff. They get rewarded for, for solving crazy problems. All right. So this one is an excellent statement. Um, as a leader, learn as much as possible about others' capabilities and limitations then give over as much responsibility as they can handle. Beautiful, right? Um, but then down here we talk about motivation. When motivating with words, leaders should use more than just empty phrases. They should personalize the message. You can still have an empty message, even if you personalize it. Hey, really good job. Appreciate your work today, Fred. Or hey, Lisa, really good job. Excellent job. Bake. Bake. Right, you have to you have to do it. I remember once I said something to uh, somebody that worked for me, and uh, we'd gone round and round, and a couple times they thought I was full of crap and all this sort of stuff, and then they finally saw things the way I did and started doing a really good job and became excellent. And I pulled them aside one day, just out of the blue, I said, "Hey, look, I just want to tell you something." I said, "I know that we've sort of had some friction, but I am really proud of what you're doing right now. You're doing excellent work." I mean, you, you you have achieved way more than even you thought. And I, I just wanted to let you know that I recognize that. He went around and told like 15 people, hey, the boss said I did a good job. Right? I meant it. But it wasn't just everybody, hey, good job, hey, good job, hey, good job, you know. 
Now, I this one right here got me curious. <laughs> so this is 2006, so we've been at war for three years, right? When a unit prepares for an emergency deployment, all key leaders should be involved to share the hard work to get the equipment ready to ship. This includes leadership presence at night, weekends, and all locations and conditions where the troops are toiling. Why is that in there? That means that's in there because people weren't doing it. Hey, everybody's up till midnight packing up stuff and getting vehicles ready and we're gonna, I'm gonna go, go home and have dinner and not help. So the rule is, is what I was taught, the leader is supposed to be at the decisive point in the battle, whatever and the, you know, the battle is any sort of operation. So the last person working, leader should still be there, right? If you've got people just working late and you're not around, that's terrible. But why is that in there? This should be obvious. The fact that that has to be in there is a little uh, telling to me. Um, okay, so then we talk about improving. Once again, we're talking about the motor pool. It says, by stressing, stressing the team effort and focusing learning, the motor sergeant can gradually and continuously improve the unit. The sergeant's personal example sends an important message to the entire team. Improving the organization is everyone's responsibility. The team effort to do something about its shortcoming is more powerful than any lecture. This is talking about the motor sergeant talking again. So this is a little extreme because when I read this, I was going, okay, what if none of the vehicles operate? There's no gradual improvement to that. You need to fix that immediately. And so then the leadership style changes. Everything's got to be different. You might have to find, you know, immediately find out why, immediately go off it. It's, it's this gradual improvement thing is sort of weird. If, if things require radical improvement, then you need to motivate them for radical improvement. Not gradual, right? So this gradual thing, it just bugs me. I don't know why it didn't sit with me very well. Um, oh, remember in the last one, in the last review we talked about, they said, now that you've taken an oath to be a leader, well, these are the true to the two oaths for enlistment and for becoming an officer. And nothing in here says I'm taking an oath to be a leader. Although I've been thinking, I've been still been kicking around the idea about a leadership oath, but that's still weird. But, but yeah, there's no oath for leadership. Um, you can look these up. Just look up Oath of Enlistment and Oath for Commissioned Officers because I'm not sure. Well, you can probably read this. Let me make it a little bigger. Eh, probably not much better. Um, yeah, so this got me in a lot of trouble. Um, so when they came out with the Army Values, they said, okay, these are the core values that we have for the Army. These are what are important, blah, 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 blah. So loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. Cool, right? I was being super sincere when I asked. This was in the late 90s. I said, well, we couldn't come up with a couple of E's and an A. They said, what would you do? I said, energy, audacity, and empathy. I said, ah, you're a smart Alex. You don't want people to have energy. You don't want people to have audacity try something that's never been done before and you don't want people to have empathy? Nope. Anyway. Um, all right. So we're moving on down. Just I'm just going through. These are comments that are different. Like I said, if you've watched all of these, you'll understand why I'm highlighting these. Um, so I highlighted this one. Army leaders selected to command are expected to lead beyond merely exercising formal authority. They should lead by example, serve as role models, since their personal example and public actions carry tremendous moral force. For that reason, people inside and outside the Army recognize commanders as the human faces of the system, the ones who embody the Army's commitment to readiness and care of people. By virtue of their role, Army commanders must lead Change with lead change with clear vision, encompassing yesterday's heritage, today's mission, and tomorrow's force. So what bugs me about that is they say selected to command, but the, the, during the time that I was in, it was, well, you had to get a command to get promoted. And so it was a check the block. So nobody was selected. And people that should never have been in charge of people were to put in charge and were terrible. Destroyed organizations, messed up people's morale, all sorts of terrible stuff. So that's... That's 
this is a great statement, but they're not doing it, right? So that this is the whole integrity thing, right? Um, okay, so here's the Army Leadership Requirements Model. So we've got Army Values, Empathy, Warrior Ethos. So look, they put empathy in here. Hey, I made the cut. Military bearing, physically fit, blah, blah, blah. A leader with intellectual capacity, mental agility, sound judgment, innovation, interpersonal attack, domain knowledge. Competencies, lead, extend influence, leads by example, communicates, creates a positive environment, prepares self, develops others, gets results. All right, this is great. Where do we find these people? And what are we doing to make these people? Notice one thing, right? Leads others. Where's care of the soldiers? Develops, okay. Where's, where's take care of soldiers? But there's gets results. Right? I mean, just think about that for a minute. Um, all right. So three major factors that determine a leader's character values, empathy, and the warrior ethos. Some characteristics are present in the beginning of a leader's career, while others develop over time through additional education, training, and experience. All right. So what values? Right? What the warrior ethos? And then empathy. So, so when is it acceptable to not have these as a leader? And then the warrior ethos is a pain in my neck. Um, but, but yeah, it just, this, this bothers me, right? So, so, so that means it says some are present at the beginning. Well, how do we check for them? How do we identify them? What if they don't have any values? What if they're corrupt? What if they have no integrity? Should we put them in charge? Right? That's not what we're doing. Um, and then I love this. So core leader competencies. So look, here's all the stuff a leader's supposed to do, but there's no how, right? I have no education and I walk in, so I'm going to set the conditions for a positive climate. How do you do that? There's no how even in the document. There's no how anywhere. Here's what we want. We want this. We want the, the, the big chart before, and then we want the, the statement at the beginning. Where do we find these people? This is a lot of work. And a bunch of this is good, but there's no how. So it's, you know, and then is this, if this is important, this should be the evaluation system. Did you enforce standards? Did you balance the mission and welfare soldiers? Oh, hey, there we go. Welfare, okay. And then we skip down to this one. So leadership roles, levels, and leadership teams. So I say this entire chapter is irrelevant because all it does is talk about how you're supposed to lead at different levels. Well, one, a natural leader is going to know that. Two, it's still leadership. You're still leading the people that are closest to you through personal example, but then you got to check more. You got to do all this. It's the same stuff. It's just at different levels. The higher up you go, the more you should check because then you got to go tune up those other leaders. <sighs> anyway, um, so down here, this is, this is why I say this chapter is a mess, right? So leadership is expected from everyone in the army, regardless of designated authority or recognized position of responsibility. Every leader has the potential to assume ultimate responsibility. So what is it? Pick one. You've got three now. Anybody can do it. Only people that have positions of authority can do it. And the army expects everybody to do it. Well, I've seen where there's nobody that can do it. I've seen people that they should just have been a technician their whole life because they were amazing at it and then we went and put them in charge and wrecked them <clears throat> um oh yeah i am sorry i made a little snarky comment I said what the heck are they talking about the army is not granted with magic leadership fairy dust that they can sprinkle over everyone and make them a leader this reasoning is crazy yes um okay empowering subordinates well Whoop, 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 whoop. I just messed up. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then we come down to what army leaders should have. They must have character, presence, intellect, and do whatever is asked of them. Well, what about the army value? What about the values, the warrior ethos, and something else? This is what every a person should have. This a, per, a person should have good character, and good presence, and intellect. Okay, but not. 
you know, we're just jumping around too much now. All right, so we get to integrity. This actually isn't too bad, right? Leaders of integrity consistently act according to clear principles, not just what works now. I'm mean, relies on leaders of integrity who possess high moral standards, who are honest in word and deed. Leaders are honest to others by not presenting themselves in the actions. Leader stands for the truth. If a mission cannot be accomplished, a leader's integrity requires them to inform the chain of command. Yeah, okay, and loyalty. Operational rate, talking about this. So here's some decent examples of integrity, except for we've had Abu Ghraib three years before, or two years before this. And somehow those, everybody, you know, everybody got away with it except for a couple of soldiers. Right? And then we've got no example again of, of the My Lai Massacre. Now, this is what's fascinating to me. Right after this, under personal courage, we talk about Warren Officer Thompson, who was in the My Lai Massacre. And here's something he did because he saw some civilians getting shot. We're going to talk about it under personal courage, but not integrity, where everybody lied. It's, it's maddening. It's madness. All right, character development. I think that we're going to do a video on character because it keeps coming around and everybody says you must have character. What characteristics, right? So, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm jumping around. I'm sorry. So then we come down here with the last bit of, bit of stuff before we go to the next one. So core leader competencies. So now we go down to the competencies. So here we go. This is interesting because this is seven pages. Here's all the stuff you're supposed to do to lead. And here's all the, I mean, it's a lot, right? And then you come down to here. Here's still leads. Communicates. Now here's how you communicate. So what's the problem with this? Creates a positive environment. Right? Prepare yourself. This is a lot of stuff. This is what my problem is. My problem is, I think, that they're trying to come up with as many answers as possible for what makes a leader. But this is pages and pages of stuff a leader is supposed to do. You're supposed to do all this and run your organization and mentor and coach and teach. A bunch of this stuff you can't do ever. So anyway, all right, how are we doing here? Oh, good. So that's the, the 20, um, I'm sorry, 2006 version. So I, I put in here that this one actually feels bad because they took a bunch of, um, is this the, the thing that's got it? No, I'm sorry, I'm skipping around. Um, here are a bunch of terms that were taken out of the other document. Leader teams, officership, shared leadership, virtual team, adaptability, no longer a formally defined army values, attribute, climate, coaching, core leader competencies, critical thinking, Direct leadership, domain knowledge, ethical reasoning, military bearing. These are all important terms. We just took them out. We don't like them. We don't think they're interesting anymore. <sighs> anyway, so what bothered me about the 2016 version, we took out a whole big chunk of it. And then here's what we say that leaders are supposed to do or what this document's supposed to do. Understand the Army definitions. Use the Army leadership requirements as a common basis for thinking about leadership. Become knowledgeable about roles and responsibility of leaders. Discover what makes a good leader. Learn how to lead, develop, and achieve. And identify the influences and stresses in our environment. It's almost phoned in, right? Integrity. This is all there is on integrity. Do what's legally right and morally. And we start taking out examples. Here's personal courage. We took out me lie, right? And then now this is where I get really bothered. So we're under leads. Using compliance and commitment. Okay, now remember this because later on, um, talks about methods of influence, pressure, legitimating, exchange, personal, collaboration, rational persuasion, apprising, inspirational participation, and then how to overcome resistance. 
So now we've got an adversarial relationship with our soldiers. And then I come down here to the leads, right? Morale is the Army's most important intangible human element. It is a measure of how people feel about themselves, their team, and their leaders. Units can achieve high morale through effective leadership, shared effort, trust, and mutual respect. High morale results in a, co in a cohesive team striving to achieve common goals. Competent leaders know that morale holds a team together and sustains it during operations. Okay, so then what do you do to boost that? But this is my favorite part, right? So this is what we're saying morale is. Morale is trust, um, effective leadership, mutual respect. This is the definition of high morale. But right before that, we talked about how to influence, manipulate, comply, make people comply, overcome resistance. So we've got this us versus them mentality, but we're going to have high morale. And we're going to build it by making people trust us and feel confident. You see the problem. And then the last comment I had in here is how do you build trust? It says leaders need to be competent and have good character to be trusted. Leaders who coach, counsel, and mentor subordinates establish close relationships and foster trust. How about you just don't lie and have integrity? Right? And so that's the same competency stuff from the other one. Now we're going to go to 2019. 2019. So this is great. Uh, I put this in here because I've quoted this gentleman ever since I met him in um, 1990. I'm old. 1993, getting ready to graduate from officer school, and this gentleman who went to officer school came and spoke to us. And it, I really can't remember. I remember I wrote it down. Either I asked it or somebody sitting right next to me asked, because people were asking, what's it like to get the Medal of Honor and all this stuff? And I think I asked it, but I would say I am 51% sure that I asked it, which means if somebody out there remembers that they did, then fine. But I said, hey, what makes a great officer? He said, uh, respect your superiors like your parents, treat your peers like your brothers and sisters, and care for your subordinates like your children, and don't worry about medals and awards because they'll just happen. Wrote that down and I've used it forever. Um, so, integrity. Do what's right, legally and morally. This is it on integrity in 2019. Leaders of integrity consistently follow honorable principles. The Army relies on leaders who are honest in word and deed. Leaders of integrity do the right thing. As an Army leader and a person of integrity, personal values should reinforce the Army values. That's integrity. We've lost the plot. That it, you've, if you've been watching this, I've been talking about integrity the entire time, and now it's down to nothing. Recognizing diversity. I don't understand why this is in here. It makes no sense to me. Because listen to this. Personal perspectives vary within every individual human being in societal groups. Fact. Understanding the different backgrounds, qualifications, experiences, and potential of each of individuals and organization is an important part of being an effective leader. Fact. It is fundamental to knowing your people and harnessing their diverse skills and perspectives to build cohesive teams. In fact, good leaders create conditions where subordinates know they are valued for their individual talent, skills, perspective, and continuous accomplishment. Yes. What leader does not do that? If you've got people that are not attuning competence in environmental hierarchies in pursuit of a goal, you don't have a leader. I don't understand this at all, especially in 2019. It's, it's like you don't look at somebody and say, well, who's, you know, who's my best marksman? And then say, well, I'm not going to use you. I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, develops leaders. Yeah, I love this. This is it, this one is just, I swear it's just phoned in because it's nothing. It's all blah. Lead, learning to be a leader requires knowledge of leadership, experience using this knowledge and feedback from one's seniors, peers, and subordinates. It also requires opportunities to practice leading others as often as possible. Okay. Again, you're going to learn it from 
knowing leadership, experience using the knowledge and feedback from seniors. All right, well, what if you don't have a senior that's doing a good job mentoring you? What if you don't, what if your peers are all idiots? You know what I mean? It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, leader development of others involves recruiting, assessing, developing, assigning, promoting, and retaining the leaders who have potential for levels of greater responsibility. Leaders develop subordinates when they prepare and challenge them with greater responsibility. Accountability. It is the individual professional response individual professional responsibility of all leaders to develop their subordinates as leaders. Just, just talking in circles. Right? Because that's it for development. And you come down here. Counseling, coaching, mentoring. So this chart is a mess. Right? So counseling, the purpose. Source, interaction, how it works, outcome, requirement, occurrence. So review the past or current performance, guide learning, mentoring. Um, source, rate or chain of command of counseling. Assign coach with trainer for coaching. Mentoring, those with greater experience. This can't be the same person. And what if the mentor might be coaching or might be rating or might be uh, doing something? It, this is this... This, this chart makes no sense to me because to me, these are all the same things. Sometimes, sometimes you have to counsel somebody. Sometimes you mentor them. Sometimes you coach them. It's not different people. It's not, it, it might be different people, but more often than not, if you've got a good boss, it's that one person. All right. Leadership and management. Boo, hiss. That's what I wrote down. All right. Yeah, you have to manage your resources, but that's resources. You lead people. You manage things. Then you come down here to counterproductive leadership. So that's really toxic behavior. Then you've got abusive. Now, this is I put down this was interesting because this is actually sort of coming back to leadership indicators. Abusive behaviors, self-serving, erratic, incompetence, and corruption. So if you've got those people, you've got a bad leader. I'm, I'm on board, 100%. Okay, so that's it. So what bothers me is that we've lost integrity. We don't talk about humility anywhere anymore. We don't talk about what it takes to develop a leader. This is just more of here's how to be a good person and sort of look over people. I, I read this one and it was the most anemic. The last three versions of the Army Leadership Manual are a waste of time. I don't think that you learn or know anything out of them. Maybe I'm biased, but I don't. I honestly don't think so. Because looking through, it's just, it's a bunch of fluff. Like I said, hey, somebody needs to go write this document. Okay, here you go. Anyway, I'm sorry for babbling. All right, so that concludes this, and then the next thing is going to be my final video, where I basically do a summary and maybe some analysis of current leadership trends in the military. I hope you have a great day. Yeah.